from the dark web to your radio dial. You are listening to CyberTalk Radio on News 1200 WOAI. Welcome to CyberTalk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20 year internet security veteran. And uh, this week, we're going to talk about developing hardware and software systems for robots. Uh, we've, we've joked a little bit that the Terminator is coming on this program before, uh, but as we have a discussion here, you'll see that uh, the hardware and software, the folks that are building these robots are much more responsible than the ones out there in the movies. So, uh, Eric, uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Always good to talk about uh, robots. It's very much in the zeitgeist right now, so... Uh Good times. Yes. So uh, share a little bit with the audience about uh, your background, uh, company, and, and how you got excited about this robotic space. Yeah. So I'm a robot geek full time. Uh, and that happened because I was going to starve as a physicist. Uh, you know, did my undergrad work in physics and it was going to go nowhere fast, I could tell. Uh, but all through college in the summers, I worked my way through school. Uh, in Minnesota, programming what was a welding robot. Yeah. And, you know, sort of fell into that and ended up not going on to grad school uh, and joining up with the robot company that had supplied those. And I stayed there for 25 years. Uh, that was uh, Yaskawa. So they were, you know, the second largest robot company globally. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that pulled me out of my Texas confines and stuck me in the Rust Belt for a couple of decades, and uh, I was eager to get home. So you, you uh, decided to head back to Texas and start your own robotics company? Uh, not in that order. So I came back to Texas in 05, uh, and it was the Toyota plant that brought me home. So uh, the company I worked for was a very important robot supplier to Toyota. Toyota, of course, consumes a lot of robot technology. And uh, I said, hey, that's my ticket back to San Antonio. And uh, we came back in, in 05 and supported the you know, build of that plant and all the robots in that facility and all of the suppliers. And I did that for uh, 10 years. And then in 2015, uh, decided to start Plus One Robotics with a couple of co-founders here in SA. Yeah. So for, for those uh, listening outside the San Antonio area, we have... Uh the truck factory here that builds, I think it's all of the Tundras and most of the Tacomas in That's the right. U.S. That's yeah. Right. Uh, so if you, you see a Toyota truck out there, um, one of the, the robots that uh, you set up uh, worked on that truck and helped make part of that assembly line go. That's absolutely right. And so if you're sitting in a Tundra or a Tacoma, that's those seats were welded with robots. The headliner was cut with robots. The I mean, all sorts of processes in an automotive factory are uh, robot friendly yeah and I, I went out on a, a tour and if you're interested they they do tours for the the public you can go down there and see a museum and uh, just seeing many of the things on that assembly line where the, you, you've got the chassis and you've it, the chassis is moving along but it, it gets twisted and flipped into a position that makes it easier for people to work with it so you're not bending and squatting or moving into awkward spots so that stuff can keep flowing smooth i just watching it it's almost like a ballet yes the ergonomically neutral assembly line yeah that's uh so there's a fancy term there for for that uh, of yeah, me observing it going this looks like i could actually stand and do that job and you can because of the ergonomically friendly assembly line there you go so for for robots, uh, I think we we get them in the scenario there, kind of a, a fixed in place robot on an assembly line. Uh, is that the type of stuff Plus One is working on, or, or how are you guys uh, taking this this startup and evolving what you're doing with robots? Yeah, so our robots are fixed, right? We don't make humanoid bipedal robots, you know, walking around. Uh, they are. Uh, in place. They are, in fact, the same robots that you would find on an automotive assembly line. Uh, we just taught an old dog new tricks. Uh, plus one focuses on the supply chain and logistics space, and that is almost orthogonal to manufacturing, right? Automotive manufacturing, your life is going to be, I need to do the exact same task every, you know, 55 seconds, for the next four years. Yeah. And robots are really good at that classically because what robots have is endurance and a physical memory. Yeah. They're good at consistently being consistent. Yes. 
And supply chain is nothing like that. No. Because what you ordered, you know, today is not what you're going to order tomorrow. You know, today you might be ordering razors and tomorrow it's going to be kombucha. Yeah. And that variability is a real problem for automation. Uh, you have to discover everything before you every time. And so this sort of closing the loop with perception, with sensing, is what Plus One stepped into because that's what the logistics and supply chain world needs. Though, you know, if I pick up the water bottle on the table, it involves three elements. It's going to be my eyes, my arm, and my hand in that order. Yeah. And robots are only the middle of that. They're the arm itself. And that's almost a, a well-understood 40 years in production technology. Uh, but it doesn't address the two ends of the problem that supply chain needs. Supply chain needs, one, 3D perception. I got to see where the bottle is. And then lastly, I have to pick it. And the gripper that picks a bottle may not be the same gripper that picks a box yeah. or a mesh bag or a stuffed animal. The the sort of dexterity that we have inherently in your left hand is not something robots can approach. No, and, and like if you're picking up a bottle, some of them are firm, some of them are a little squishy if it's like a, a soap or lotion bottle. And even a, a soap bottle, if you're in a big case of them, one of them might have leaked. And so now not only is it squishy in a little bit, but it's also slippery. And it wasn't slippery when you grabbed the previous one. And we can determine all those things. I think all these things people take for granted, the, the processing power of the human mind. Absolutely. I, I am a human exceptionalist. Yeah. I have been doing robots for so long that I recognize that people are better than robots at everything. Uh, and uh, certainly everything in the supply chain world because of all the things that you've talked about, right? Yeah. It's, it's perception. Uh, it's not just the ability to, to see in stereo pair and understand depth. Uh, it's also tactile sensing, force, uh, you know, all of those things that come to play that you're right, we don't even think about. And, and then I would remind you that every robot you've ever seen has only one hand and you've got two. And the cooperation that you can affect between your left hand and your right hand uh, is really amazing. And uh, you can clap your hands behind your head. For a, a pair of robots to do that would be an engineering feat yeah. of, you know, IO control and timing and speed and all of that. And, you know, we just do it. So people are better than robots. And that's the sort of mantra of Plus One is robots work, people rule, right? If you come from the premise that people are better, then you make different choices as to what the robots sort of get relegated to. Yeah. So as, as you're, you're going through dealing with all these limitations, you're trying to make the robot smart enough to be able to, to pick things off of shelves and put it into a box for shipping. So as, as you're going through this process, kind of how did you guys tackle this? Because, like, I mean, you knew robots were stupid when you started. I think a lot of folks are getting into the space – they they see some of the demo videos and they're like, well, these robots are amazing. We should use them for all sorts of things. And then they get into the reality of it. So you came from a point of knowing at the beginning where robots were at. And so what made you kind of believe that you it was ready to be tackled? And then kind of how are you guys doing on this picking and perception? Yeah. So, um, you know, you the application you brought up would be called each picking. Right. So that is the ordered item into its shippable. And that is, in some ways, the sexiest problem in robot automation for distribution and warehousing and e-com because of, wow, there's like a million different SKUs under the roof and every one of them is different. And even the ones you think are the same aren't really because yeah. it's, you know, the 12 pack of AA batteries. But, ooh, this has the Super Bowl promotional packaging. And all of yeah. a sudden the camera's like, what are those? Yeah. All right. So. Um, we started at the other half of the building, which is once you have taken all those items that you ordered and probably didn't need, but were packaged into its shippable, whether that's an envelope or a box or, 
you know, a Jiffy mailer, whatever it is, you've taken, I don't know, a million different SKUs and you've collapsed it into a handful, a large handful, but a tractable problem. Yeah. And we applied our 3D vision perception to that. It's called the cluttered pile problem, right? Uh, and it's, if I have a, a whole mess of these packages here and I need to put them onto a system one at a time, singulation, uh, you know, how do you do that? And people do this all the time throughout this industry is just take a pile and make them out one at a time. And so that's really where we focused is on that. Um, and then as the, as the technology matures, you move upstream to the you know, greater problem of the variability of all the different SKUs themselves. Yeah, so you're, you're working with package boxes, getting them on and off of trucks or on and off of a pallet or on and off of whatever thing they need to go to get to the next step. Right, and if you were to uh, you know, sort of take a distribution center or, or e-com fulfillment center and peel the roof away, you would see a number of people um, you know, sort of doing the each picking and order fulfillment piece. And then you got a whole bunch of other people dealing with it as a package. Yeah. And, uh, you know, both of them are legitimate applications of 3D vision and 3D vision guided manipulation. Yeah. So this e-commerce thing is growing. I think it's here to stay. And uh, so for making these warehouses more consistent, efficient, uh, and frankly, being able to get enough labor to because, I mean, this is, I think, where the, the robotic piece comes in is as these facilities grow and we move to this type of stuff without robots in there. I don't know. If there's enough people to do the jobs. That's right. Um, you know, this is a labor availability crisis in that space. Yeah. Uh, we as the consumer, you can't under you can't overestimate the power of convenience in the American economy. And so, you know, we are perpetually as the consumer putting more onus on how quickly can I get it? Uh, how short a duration between when I make my decision and when I enjoy the benefit. Uh, and so that pushes more and more, um, you know, sort of these requirements onto the entire supply chain. Where is people all going to come from? You know, when labor is as tight as it is now, people have options. Yeah. And they'll go find something else to do than stand in front of a cluttered pile of boxes all day. So, um, you know, these are often antisocial working hours. You know, when do sorts take place? Well, they take place overnight. Yeah. And uh, so between sort of the repetitive motions associated with it, the you know, if you think about robots classically, right, the three D's of robotics, they take tasks that are dirty, dangerous or degrading to the human spirit. And, you know, these aren't dirty tasks. You're not in a coal mine, um, but they are repetitive motion. So there is, you know, a danger health benefit, you know, that has to be considered. Uh, and then the other is it's just dull. Yeah. So uh, these are the types of tasks that you that people welcome any kind of productivity tool to come on board. And so the 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 truth is no robot ever deployed in a warehouse or a fulfillment center ever resulted in a pink slip. Nobody goes home. There's not enough labor to go around as it is. This is a growth play. Yeah. And, you know, until there is some, uh, you know, structural change to the labor market, which I don't see, then you have to bring uh, tools to bear anywhere you can. And that's really all automation and robots are it's a productivity tool uh do more with the people that you have invest that human capital into those applications where you couldn't put a productivity tool because it takes the cognition the decision making the dexterity the flexibility of like real people yeah no, and I think office workers and have seen productivity tools. If you you look at what we can do now with a computer, and um, you can take your computer into a conference room. You don't have to take a notepad and write the notes down on paper. Then go back to your computer that's connected physically to a network and type your notes in to send an email and things that you can do all this digitally. As I'm like one of our producers uh, sits here in the studio with us, laptop out, yeah, working productively without doing that. And same things happening across all these uh, other areas where. 
I mean, the laptop is a robot, not very dexterous, but it uh, takes in input there from a person doing things with it and, and produces the, the output more efficiently. So I think all across the areas we're seeing these different um, applications and, and human productivity increases, which makes things more affordable, makes uh, all of this stuff uh, like the, the a Toyota truck couldn't cost what it costs if you were t- trying to assemble the whole thing by hand. It would cost what a Ferrari costs. There's a car that's assembled without robots. Right. And uh, the other thing that I would say just on the robot side, it used to be a joke that you didn't want a car that was assembled on a Monday or a Friday. Yeah. Right. And that joke has left our thinking because it doesn't matter anymore because these productivity tools give you that same work regardless. And so anywhere that you can do that is a benefit to the market. You're listening to 1200 WAI. This is Cyber Talk Radio, and I'm joined by the founder of Plus One Robotics. And uh, if you just turned your radio on, you can listen to the rebroadcast of this up on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com on Tuesday, February the 19th. If you're listening to us uh, via the website, thank you very much. Uh, we're also out there on all the different podcasting services. If you have a favorite podcasting service where you cannot find our program, uh, please reach out to us on Facebook or Twitter. We will fix that, and we will get you a Cyber Talk Radio t-shirt. Uh, we also uh, accept uh, show ideas, submissions, and other comments uh, via Facebook, Twitter, or that website as well. So uh, please reach out to us and let us know uh, what we're doing right and, and what you would like to see us do differently. So, Eric, as, as you were talking through this, so you guys um, raised a bunch of, of money to go build these robots to help make those uh, warehouses and fulfillment, the supply chain side of the, the world, more efficient here recently. Yeah, that's right. Um, we started... Uh, in 2016 early, uh, but it was uh, bootstrapped for over a year. And then in uh, early 2017, we took our first, uh, you know, tranche of other people's money. Uh, and uh, subsequent to that, we raised an A round in September of last year. Uh, and, you know, it's, uh, it, it's a hot space. And it's not, uh, you know, there's lots of venture dollars coming into automation in general, and certainly anything associated with e So I won't say that it was easy. None of it ever is. No. Uh, but you, you, you knew going in you were in a good place, right? Yeah. So I think when you're out there for, for those uh, that read about this stuff, whether it's TechCrunch or other places, you see these companies announcing a fundraising round, um, and you're like, well, you know what? Maybe I'm going to go try this. And you put a deck together and you talk to three investors and they all tell you no. Um, you're just getting started. Uh, most of those successful fundraisings are 50 phone calls or 100 phone calls and then 30 meetings and then 10 follow-up meetings, and then eventually out of that you have a term sheet from a couple of them. So uh, for those out in our listening audience, don't get discouraged if you're on meeting number seven. Uh, you're, you're just beginning, and most of the other folks that have gone through this uh, didn't realize it the first time either. Yeah, and I would say that what was the most significant was – Find those investors that understand the problem you're solving. It's less about your solution, right? They know you're wicked smart and you've got all kinds of technology behind you. They just want to know that you're solving a legitimate problem. And the only way that you can convince them of that is if it's a problem they know. Yeah. So uh, that's that's what kind of turned the the page for us is we did the same thing. You know, we went to Sand Hill. We went, you know, all over. We were here in San Antonio doing yeah. our thing. And it wasn't until we got in front of somebody that lives, breathes supply chain that said, aha. And then after that, it it really does fall into place quickly. So, yeah, but you got to go through 49 of those before you get to that 50th that really understands. Yeah, no, uh, completely. So now that you, you've done this, which um, are you guys software? Are you building robots yourself? Are you doing software for other people's robots? How, how is the, the product coming together here? Yeah, so um, like we talked about, if, if we think of it in terms of those three elements, right, the eyes, the arm, and the hand, uh, we are a software company. We do perception. We work on the vision software, and the rest of it we are agnostic to. So we are robot agnostic. And that's kind of an important decision that had to be made architecturally early uh, because, you know, those clients 
you know, all of them have established relationships with their automation providers or some robot supplier, and they're going to make those decisions based on a hundred factors you don't control. Yeah. So anybody that sort of says, this is my partner, I work with these robots, you're putting yourself at risk because there's going to be half the market that's not going to talk to you. So uh, that puts the onus on our team to write the software in such a way that it is sufficiently modular that it won't matter. And that was, you know, kind of an important element to our offering in the market. And that, that plays well. The same is true with the gripper. You know, there are folks out there that make really kind of cool grippers. And then they say, all right, I'm going to, you know, go to market with that. Uh, it's the same thing. Nobody's been able to develop your left hand, let alone two of them uh, working together. So any gripper that you put on a robot is a compromise from the word go. So rather than uh, saying, okay, we'll pick this particular gripper or another, we said, no, we would write the software such that any gripper would be adaptable to our offering. So plus one makes the vision piece, the, the, the algorithms and the software that interprets this point cloud. Right? So when you're talking about 3D sensors, you, you, you think in terms of voxels. Uh, so this point cloud gets generated, and it's our technology that sort of parses it and makes the decision, what is the next best thing to go pick? And there's a whole set of rules that, that constrain that decision, and that's kind of where we live. Yeah. So as I, I'm thinking about this, I was watching a, a video uh, this last week about some uh, agricultural robots. Uh, so they're pulling tomatoes out of a field and then they've got these paddles in there swapping the red and the green tomatoes onto different sides of the the bin like pretty rapidly so that type of stuff is what you're you've got vision in it that's able to do those sorts of things but maybe in the picking side maybe even it's more complicated yeah so um those sorts of sortation tasks yeah right that paddle was a one degree of freedom operation it yeah. went flip and something went the other direction yeah right uh picking is a six degree of freedom problem i have to know its x y z location and the orientation my hand has to take to be able to pick it so uh computationally it is more intensive but those systems that you talk about are just fascinating to watch because they are wicked fast. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, like, this this thing is driving along on a tomato field. They're feeding up a conveyor belt, and there's, like, a whole bunch of these little flippy paddles just knocking tomatoes back and forth and knocking tomatoes in a way that's not smashing and bruising the tomatoes. So, like, lots of tuning. But that thing only works for tomatoes, I'm sure. The, the, it does not handle variance at all. Right. And, you know, sort of the this whole revolution that's happening in, in ag, where they're bringing technology to bear on a, a number of these, every one of them is a bespoke solution for a particular crop or what have you. There is no general purpose approach here uh, for all the you know reasons you just stated. So uh, for listeners out there on 1200 WAI, we are heading into a uh, bottom of the hour news traffic and weather update here in a few moments. Uh, we've been talking robotics uh, with... Eric, uh, the founder of Plus One Robotics, a company here headquartered in San Antonio, uh, out in Port San Antonio. We'll ask how they ended up out there uh, after the break. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit more into the uh, the futures of where are robots headed, uh, what are we going to see over the next uh, five years, 10 years, 20 years, at what point can I have Rosie the Robot in my house uh, as a maid? Uh, as a we see the Boston Dynamics videos of uh, the robots that can walk around. Uh, what they don't show you in those videos is the battery life on them is about seven minutes right now if they're not plugged into a harness. Uh, so uh, Rosie could vacuum about half of one room and then she's going to lay down and charge for three days. Well, it's not three days, but she'll charge for quite a while. So we're going to talk some more about where robots are headed uh, here uh, after our break uh, with Eric and the Plus One Robotics. So if you aren't going to be able to stick with us after the break, uh, you can catch this uh, up on our website or on your favorite uh, podcasting service, uh, iTunes. The kids are using the cool Stitchers ones. I'm still an old guy on Pocket Cast. Uh, like it, and uh, you can listen to us there. This will be up Tuesday, February the 19th.
welcome back to Cyber Talk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20 year internet security veteran. And if you uh, were with us through the first half of the program, we're talking robots today with Eric Nieves, the founder of Plus One Robotics, uh, one of the three co founders, correct? Right. Yes. So uh, we uh, talked about kind of his history in the industry, uh, some of where things were at. And uh, if you wanted to catch that, you can. Check it out on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com on Tuesday, February the 19th. It'll also be out there on all the podcasting services across the Internet. If you are listening to us on one of those podcasting services now, thank you for uh, joining in. The program uh, airs live uh, on Saturday nights uh, on 1200 WAI Radio or iHeart Streaming. If you happen to be outside of uh, the middle 30 states area, uh, AM Radio Waves do a great job uh, in the evenings uh, when we air. So, uh, 1200 WA broadcast at a very strong signal, and you can reach most of uh, the middle of America with it. So, Eric, we had uh, told the folks um, uh, before that break, we we're going to talk a little bit, because, I mean, you said robots are, are really stupid, um, and they're stupid today. So we see these science fiction movies. I'm going to stick on the happy side of things. So I'm going to go back to my childhood, the, the Jetsons, Rosie the Robot. She did all the stuff around the house. Um, got the kids dressed, ready for school, could cook anything in the kitchen. Uh, is is that something we're five years away from or 50 years away from? Or which one's closer? Yeah, you're definitely closer to 50 than a five. Okay. Um, Dang and, it. Yeah, yeah. Rosie is like this touchstone in the robotics mindset, right? Because, you know, Rosie exhibited all of the qualities we want. Right? Yeah. She was a mobile robot. Yep. She w- exhibited bilateral manipulation. Fancy word for she had two hands. Yes. Uh, She had all manner of perception. She could see. She could hear. uh, And probably the most important one, Rosie was easy to program. Yeah. You would say, Rosie, vacuum the living room. Yeah. Right? And so all of this natural language processing. Yeah. Rosie had all that. Yes. And so, you know, this all of the technologies that would have to come to bear to make that happen Sure, we have NLP. Yes, there's work on batteries and such. So you mobile manipulation is a thing, but you are a long way from having a household robot that will do all the things that that Rosie, you know, does. So uh, but we never lose sight of her. Right. No. we're always thinking about what do we what is the next piece that we have to optimize on? All of the elements are there. It's just none of them are sufficiently mature, and all of them cost too much. I yeah. Mean, so. I mean, we look at the the robot vacuums that are out there right now, and if anyone in the listening audience, if you haven't gone to YouTube and just put in uh, robot vacuum funny, um, you can get a whole bunch of videos because they don't have any perception of anything. Like if something is spilled on the floor, they're going to drive right over it and they're going to drag it all around the house. Yeah, it can be pretty tragic. Yeah, uh, and, and any human would immediately stop. You wouldn't just vacuum over it and keep going, but they don't know the difference between the hardwood floor, the carpet, and uh, like a, a bag of a bowl of spaghetti that's spilled. So they, they'll grab and just run over and drag spaghetti around the house or whatever else from there because they just think it's another flooring material. Right, so where robots are generally the stupidest thing on the factory floor, right? We certainly don't want to replicate that model in the house. Yeah. And that's kind of where we're at right now is, sure, if everything is, if, if the conditions are all set as ought be, then this, quote, robot, in air quotes, can do a, a functional job for you. But it is a long way from being able to deal with real life yeah so i've, I've seen um marketed i've never used one I've, i don't watch the video but i don't really believe it so like even these these shirt folding robots that like fold they iron a shirt and fold the shirt they're expensive and super duper complicated yeah like i feel like i would spend more time loading my shirt into the robot than it would take me just to iron the shirt myself and fold it yeah and isn't that you know kind of the the state of the state right now right where we think we're helping ourselves, but all we did was make our life more complicated. And, you know, we don't want that. So this uh, it kind of begs the whole question of general purpose AI. Yeah. Because, right? you, of course, you have to have all of this, uh, you know, decision making ability in order to reach, you know, Rosie. But, uh, you know, I'm 50 plus years old. This is my third AI spring. 
Yeah. You know, we've been here before. And uh, what I've come away with is, no, people are qualitatively better. It's not just in quantity. It is our minds, our brains are truly different and exceptional. I am a human exceptionalist. And so, you know, I don't see us being able to get to that place. Ray Kurzweil notwithstanding, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't see AI ever being able to do anything other than what its constrained set of things is. And this is an important element to keep in mind when we talk about robots, because yes, your deep mind uh, AI was able to win at thus and such a board game, yeah. Go or chess or whatever it is, right? But like they say, it still can't know that the room is on fire, yeah. Right. So, uh, and it certainly now add the complexity of doing something in real space, where you have to sense and act in the physical space, and you just. It, it's beyond exponential, I think, in the complexity that's involved. So, uh, Rosie, we're just going to have to put on hold. Okay. Um, but it does, you know, sort of bring to mind just how much robots are in the zeitgeist right now. Yeah. Right? I mean, the Super Bowl was dull, right? Yeah. But did you notice how many robot commercials there were? I, you know, there were so many of them, I couldn't even tell necessarily. I keep track of which company was, was which and what and where. So Beer? Yeah. Tax the, returns? Tax return robots. Cell phones? All of them were using robot pitchmen somewhere in the mix. And, you know, it just... Uh, I'm actually encouraged by that because a lot of it was on the limitations of robots, right? That the robot couldn't do this or yeah. it couldn't do the, that. The, the accountant robot was laughing instead of crying when it should have been sad. Yeah, right. So, uh, and what that's telling me is we're sort of moving beyond the Terminator phase of robot in culture as, you know, assassin. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's time we did that. Right. Uh, Japan doesn't have the same consternation about robots that we do here in America. And I would argue that a lot of that is because early on, every Japanese, you know, child grew up with Jet Boy. Yeah. And, you know, Jet Boy was a robot, but he was your friendly robot and he was your helper and he was your playmate. Jet Boy was cool. So you kind of grew up with that sense. Meanwhile, on this side of the pond, yeah, you know, we grew up with the Terminator. We grew up with Terminator. Yeah, and more recently, uh, with Ex Machina. Yeah, and like, yeah, these these sorts of things where at, uh, in the Matrix, like, the, there's the ultimate one where the robots take over. Yeah, so you know, uh, it's good that we're finally seeing people recognize that the robots have limits, and we can understand that you know they're just not as capable as we are, yeah. and that that's actually okay. So. Uh, that's a shift that I welcome because uh, I think that's going to I would like to think that in the next 10 years we get past the robot apocalypse mindset right the robots aren't going to take over the robots aren't going to wreck the economy by taking all the jobs they can't right so uh, the more we acknowledge the limitations of robots, the more we can appreciate their capabilities in the right context. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the more robots can do the repetitive, mundane things of turning humans into computers, that's because humans used to be the best computer, so we sat around, and then you go back and you can watch. The term computer really came from before we even had processing chips. These were uh, teams of people that sat around and did math all day. They were human computers. Uh, they were computing numbers and equations. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can go look that up on there if you're in the younger side of our listening audience and you, you weren't aware of kind of where the term computer comes from. So as the robots eliminate that, I think it really gives us the opportunity to unlock human creativity. Like, Absolutely. So robots, when rightly deployed, take over tasks where people were acting like robots. Yeah. <laughs> where they were just doing the same thing over and over again. So, um, and when you do that, the people now can take and deploy their abilities, their creativity, their decision making into applications and processes that can more rightly use them. And the issue is, if you don't have 
productivity tools like robots and automation to do those things, well, you know what? People have to yeah, because they're necessary, right? So you are in some ways locking people into applications where they are way over spec. Yeah. And that's why, you know, you get such churn in these, you know, jobs. It's not just the fact that it's a overnight shift. It's because, you know, I don't, I don't want to keep doing this anymore. No. Right? The churn is, it, and, and supply chain and logistics, the churn is between 45 and 125% per year. So any picture you see uh, in the paper of people in a distribution center working, um, you pull that paper out six months later, chances are none of those people are there anymore. Yeah, right. it's crazy. Uh, and, and completely, I mean, expected um, with the, the, the way that, yeah, robots are not doing the jobs yet that they need to be doing. Um, it's, yeah, we're, we're still, I mean, we're at 4% unemployment here. And the, even if you look at the, the, the baseline number that we talk about, but if you look at labor force participation rate, all those things are finally growing again uh, here in the U.S. after our recession from a decade ago. Uh, we've made significant headway on that labor force participation, even as people get older and age out of the workforce uh, more with the baby boomers really starting to hit that retirement age now. Um, so, yeah, I think Japan is seeing this more acutely, which is why they've embraced robots earlier. They're, they're kind of 10 to 15, 20 years ahead of us on the age demographic side of things. So I, I heard um, we were talking a little bit during the break, but uh, so Japan tried to do a whole hotel run by robots? They did. So there were a couple of them, and one of them was in Tokyo, and one was further out, and that was their whole you know kind of shtick was it was robots uh, you know, for reception and robot porters and robots to serve in the restaurant and all that. And they had a very limited uh, staff in support of all those. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the robots ended up causing so much headache in keeping them running and such that they effectively fired half the robot staff uh, last week and, you know, brought people back in to do the work. Uh, it turns out that, you know, maybe folks aren't that excited about the receptionist being a robot dinosaur, yeah. which is what they were in this case. So, uh, you know, there, there is a affection that we have for technology, but it only goes so far. And in the end, the relationships that we really covet are interpersonal, right? It's people that we want to deal with. And so, uh, you know, the robot service model is necessarily limited. And I think that's something that the industry is just now starting to be, become aware of because, you know, we had these notions that everything was going to be robot as a service. And uh, you find out that once the novelty wears off of my robot restaurant, I don't go back. No. Yeah, I mean, and as you uh, uh, talk about this with the the front desk at the hotel, when you're coming over to to check in, I mean, I know how good the natural language processing is. If 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 that robot was as good as Siri or my Google Assistant, um, they're still not good. So the conversation you can have, especially in a hotel in Tokyo, where people are going to show up. Um, with all sorts of different accents and languages and want to speak things, you'd think, well, you know what, the the Google Assistant or Siri is going to be able to deal with 10 languages better than a an international hotel uh, front desk person. No, that's not the correct answer. Yeah, in fact, the robot would say, you know, welcome to our hotel. Uh, please don't ask me difficult questions. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you go from there? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I mean, one we've, we've talked about a little bit on the security side of this is you get these general purpose robots out there trying to communicate. Because they're so naive, there's all sorts of security implications to this stuff as well uh, because they don't have human level judgment and critical thinking skills. Uh, I mean, and this is one like we're in a controlled environment there where you guys are working in supply chain, which is less controlled than an assembly line, but still much more controlled. Uh, you don't have people coming up and trying to do manipulative things to the robots. You have other employees of the company in that secured supply chain area. 
Um, as you guys deploy software on these robots and other things, are you worried that as we get out there that um, hackers are going to figure out how to get in and, and cause an, a, a muck on these robots? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, uh, people will often ask us, why, why are you in San Antonio? Why is this robotics company in San Antonio? And what we tell them is, look, the future of this industry is not the mechanical part, right? That's a solved problem. What's important here is these are going to be connected assets on the floor. And when you do that, now the things that are important to you are cloud connectivity and cybersecurity. Yeah. And where would you rather be to see where the future is than in San Antonio? I, I wouldn't want to be in any other way than Port San Antonio where you guys are out there. Absolutely. And so, uh, you know, that's something that we're very mindful of because our customers certainly are. Nobody wants their robots stuck netted. Yeah. Right? So, you know, we all know the famous story uh, on the centrifuges in Iran and who knows who, you know, infected those PLCs with that code. But PLCs are very prevalent on the factory floor and running conveyance and everything else. And robots are tied to PLCs very often. So, yes, security is an important element of where we go next. I can tell you anytime we're getting ready to, to do a deployment, that is one of the most important pieces of documentation we have to deliver is what's your infosec policy? Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, these your software is going to go onto somebody's expensive robot. It's going to go in there to those PLCs, the programmable logic controllers, and it's going to make them smarter and better and execute steps more efficiently. Uh, but if your software has bad stuff that's snuck into it somehow, then all of their investment in these robots are protect uh, potentially wrecked. That's right. And you know, if it were if the liability were limited to oh the robot broke, then maybe we could live with that. But it's we broke their process. Yeah. And what is that worth? Yeah. Ooh, the the warehouse shut down. Yeah. Yeah. None of the customers got the products that they ordered, yeah. or so, all of the food in a in a uh, agricultural warehouse is all now spoiled. Or yeah. Yeah. And Susie didn't get her birthday gift in two days, like was supposed to happen. Yeah. You're listening to 1200 WAI. This is Cyber Talk Radio, and we're talking about robots uh, taking over the world. This is Orson Welles. Um, I'm not actually Brett Pyatt any longer. Oh, wait, no, this is not actually going to happen. Uh, we've talked for uh, the better part of the program about how robots are not taking over anytime soon. So if you just turned on right now, uh, check out the rebroadcast and replay of this on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com. Uh, it will be up on Tuesday, February the 19th. If you are listening to us on one of those podcasting services, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate shout outs on Twitter or on our Facebook page. And if uh, you have a podcasting service that you enjoy using that you cannot find our program, let us know. We will fix that and get you a CyberTalk Radio t shirt. Okay, so here's one of my other in the supply chain utopia. So um, we've got this, this last mile problem. Um, so there's uh, some drone package delivery now going on down in a, a city in Australia, I think, has been testing this out citywide, um, small uh, town there. When are we going to see drones flying in and dropping packages on porches or in the backyard or wherever else at people's houses? Yeah, I don't I'm not bullish on the consumer grade last mile drone. Right. Uh, if for no other reason than. Hey, I live in rural Guadalupe County, Texas, and that drone's going to get shot out of the sky before it ever reaches my porch. Yeah. Right. Um, but I do think that we're, st we're starting to see already kind of commercial industrial uses for drone delivery. There's a, a company that I have a lot of respect for that does drone delivery of medical supplies to underserved areas. And uh, if you haven't checked out uh, Zipline, it's uh, really interesting. And they, and what's what they do is they acknowledge that, hey, there's just the roads are impassable in, you know, that part of uh, the African continent. And, you know, the the supplies are there and the technology is there and the medical personnel are there. It's just how do you get the stuff from A to B? And that's where you see, you know, drones being truly effective. Um, one of the big parcel companies here did a, a test a year or two ago where they were uh, it was a kind of a remote campsite off the coast of New England. And 
you know, uh, a camper didn't have their inhaler and needed their inhaler. How do you get the inhaler to them quickly? Those are the sorts of things where I would see a much wider acceptance for drone technology and last mile um, than, you know, sort of the utopia of everybody's getting their pizza delivered by drone. Um, yeah, I've seen those ones too. The little drive around pizza thing. It looks like a little oven that brings your drives along and brings your pizza to you in, in urban areas. Yeah. That thing seems like it's just going to get hijacked <laughs> and who are people in the street are going to have pizza and my pizza's never getting to me. Right. There was a, you know, a movie that I enjoy back from the 80s or 90s where they stole an ATM and they spend half the movie trying to crack the ATM, you know, in this hotel room. And, uh, you know, absolutely. If you've basically got a ice chest on wheels rolling down the road and nothing going to keep somebody from putting that in the back of their pickup truck and saying, well, did we get pepperoni or did we get mushrooms today? Yeah. You know, so I'm, uh, uh, it's going to take a long time, I think, before we're ready for that. Now, the technology is actively, I mean, there's all kinds of permitting happening right now for folks to test out, you know, these last mile uh, technologies. And I, I do think that that will lead to something, but it may be a different problem that they ultimately solve than that one. Yeah. I mean, I think this uh, is, we, you look out onto the extreme long run, you have a, a semi truck trailer driving down an arterial road. Um, and then here's this, this utopian view from a delivery company perspective. I have small drones that fly out of the roof of the semi truck and drop packages on, on, the route as the semi drives on the arterial main corridor and you've just got this flock of like bees effectively that mm -hmm. are turning to back and forth to the semi truck and they can swap their batteries out there and and do all of those uh, sorts of activities and then you even have a really big drone that after that that truck trailer has delivered all of its packages that it comes in with effectively a new container lifts the old one out and drops a new one on and then the truck just keeps driving on the arterial but I think we're 50 or 100 years away from that. I mean, as you, you've talked about how dumb robots are and they can barely pick up packages and, and boxes correctly. And mm -hmm. I mean, I think we see what's going on with self-driving cars and you're like, can these things really drive a car? Yeah. yeah. You know, I think that, um, you know, Carlos Ghosn has fallen into incredible disrepute over the last month. Right. Um, but when he was running uh, Nissan, Renault, Mitsubishi, the Alliance, he, he's the one that said, hey, autonomous driving, what may be the end state or it may not be, but what would be helpful now is remotely piloted cars. Yeah. Right. So no different than, uh, you know, sending drones over the Middle East, but piloting them from, you know, Reno, Nevada or wherever it is. Uh you could see a situation where people take and drive themselves and then say, you know what, I, I don't want to drive anymore and call up a remote pilot that then takes and sees them through. But it's a human in yeah. the loop, right? And I think we're uh, seeing some of this. I talked to another startup um, that's doing forklift automation. So like for the main driving through the warehouse on the straight route from one end to the other after the the load is on the forklift it's all automated mm -hmm. but then for the 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 pickup and the drop off then a human comes in and they've got cameras on the the forklift and then that person is actually controlling it just like they're sitting in the forklift they've just got a simulator effectively that they're sitting in and they can swap and drive instead of just one forklift they're driving two or three at that point because they're not doing the the straight down the highway thing through the warehouse right so if you work from the premise that robots work people rule right then you have that force multiplier where you can say a robot or a piece of autonomy is doing the dull part but the sticky bits where you really have to interact with the world, where I've got to stick these forks in these pockets yeah. or whatever it is, that's where you have a human in the loop. And that's what I think uh, is, you know, I think gonna be the interim step. And we may find that interim is either a very long step or is just so powerful that it becomes its own end state. Uh, looking forward to uh, you guys and the great success uh, making the supply chain more efficient and things expanding out from there and uh, having robots uh, unlock human creativity here uh, over the next hundred years. 